it's this disease that's taking over everybody. And it's like, I think the future belongs to people who are just going to pay attention to the way the world actually manifests, what actually is interesting, uh, what life is actually like, and tell those stories. And that's going to win the day. This, you're right. You're so right. That's what's going to win. This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So hello everybody. I am here with Neil DeGrade. People who watch my channel have seen him around. He is uh, the head of the band Dirt Pro Robbins, but he is much more than that. We're here to talk about a new movie that he's putting together called The Queen of the Night. Very excited about it. It's like a modern fairy tale. And so I'm really looking forward to talking about that with him. Thank you for having me on. Always a pleasure. Um, you know, people might notice right now that today's video is in black and white. Um, and that is by no accident or technical error. We have... Uh, as a band, we've always done concept records, but now we've decided to add a visual component, a stronger visual component to what we're doing, and we're making a silent film. It felt like the perfect way to, oh, um, oh, create a story, a visual story that we could put our music to. So it, it felt like a no-brainer. We had the right story, and and here we are. It's called Queen of the Night. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about the the mood of it, because there's something... It, it it has an old timey uh, sense to it. You know, it's a silent film. It uh, it's using it's using kind of these classic effects, even that look kind of old timey. Um, right. But there's something about it. There's something about it that's very rich in terms of visuals that you were able to create very simply. You know, that this movie's not costing you a fortune either. All of this is an interesting idea or solution for kind of modern movie making or making stories today. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Give me a lot to comment on right there. Um, let's talk about silent films quick, quickly. Uh, you know, it's it, there's early era in films and silent films generally at first were just like they're trying to bring a play to life and things were shot like they were on a stage. Cameras wouldn't move. Uh, actors were coming in and out of the frame off stage, on stage. And the props were generally like two dimensional. So I wanted to keep an aspect of that when I did it. Like, uh, but I also, there's something very tiring about silent films. If you try to pull one up on YouTube that are like that, it's like, Oh, this is cute, but gee, an hour long of this, you know, is like, uh, okay. We don't have that attention anymore. It's like when you just want to do a puppet show for you and it just doesn't end. <laughs> you're like, there's gotta be an end. <laughs> want me to watch you play a game you're making up on the fly so uh i didn't want to do that because i'm not a huge fan of a lot of silent films i've seen i really love the movie metropolis um the cabin of dr uh caligari i love the old nosferatu i'm a huge fan of those but the versions i've seen have been fully orchestrated uh, i think i imagine back in the day from what i've heard it would be uh quite an event to go see one of these films premiere or at a larger theater because there would be a full orchestra there mm. doing it live. And so if you like to see an orchestra normally, great. But if you want to see an orchestra with a story in a movie, well, now you're talking next level. So uh, I wanted to capture more of that. I wanted to feel alive and exciting. I didn't want it to be fatiguing. Um, I did, did, when you're talking about the old timey effects, like uh, we'll show a clip in a minute, but um there is a little of that jitter and dust speckle and stuff that would appear in the film, but we didn't, we wanted to do enough. So you got it, but we didn't want to do so much that you were tired of seeing that. So we've tried to ride that line of creating that nostalgia, that sense of familiarity without the same sort of fatigue that accompanies that look and feel. Um, the film's done in an expressionistic style, uh, which was really popular in, in that time is that people were not going for realism. They were, but they wanted to capture real emotion. So there's a dreamlike quality quality to the film and its imagery things are laid out where they feel three-dimensional but it also could be it also could be like a diorama the way things yeah. are someone might be pulling the clouds along in the background uh you know <laughs> on a string and we've tried to do some uh where even when we're using computers to incorporate some of that human analog era error in the process so that's part of queen of the night and for people on who follow this channel uh, i think that they're going to without explanation, be able to start digging into some of the symbolic content. 
Yeah, so the way you're releasing it is through episodes. We're putting out the different episodes. I have the chance, you know, because of my special uh, relationship with Neil to kind of follow the the thing from the beginning and know the whole story and kind of get a sense of this really powerful uh, modern fairy tale. But for the first... For the first episode, we're going to kind of be introduced to these main characters and also uh, get a sense of what is the sim- what is the symbolic structure. It has to do with the moon, the feminine, the light, the darkness. And so maybe tell us a little bit about what it is that you're trying to explore in this story. Okay, well, uh, one of the problems is when I talk about any of these things, it the way we'll talk about it right now is not the way it comes to me. Yeah. Uh, an image will come to me and then I'll start like almost question questioning it. Like, why am I seeing this right now? So um, pretty much every one of my stories I've done or concept record starts with a singular image. And then I like, I've become like an inquisitor of that image. It's like, why are you there? Why are you holding that? Why are you, why are you standing in this spot? Why are you crying? Why are you, you know, um, why are you on top of this building? Why are you on this mountain? Those type of things. So, and then I, I just slide things around and then suddenly things will uh, fall into place um, very quickly. And, and before I really knew what I was doing with this, uh, when I go back and look at my older work, it still feels like now that I understand like some of the symbolic content and story a little more explicitly, it still was already fitting, even though I didn't even know really what I was doing or what I was talking about. I just had an intuition. So uh, what we're about to talk about here is not why the story was created. In fact, that's why um, we could share this with people. I brought Jonathan in uh, pretty early on in 2021 when uh, once I had the story and I wanted to tell it to you because uh, I didn't want to think about some of those elements, but I thought since you weren't a creator, I would do that and that you would basically slap me back in line. Um, but that's not really what happened. Uh, I think we had a really good collaboration on this is that I shared the story with you and it was like, it was more of a yes and. It was more, yeah, it was more like, this is awesome. Hey, what about this? But like, it's, it's so much of it was so right. The intuition was so right. So you add, you added layers and you explained things to me I didn't even notice, like, because I, I didn't want to... I didn't want to spoil it by explicitly adding um, analogous or allegory to the content or um, typology uh, on purpose. I didn't want to do it on purpose. I think I absorbed the world through this typological lens and more of the symbolic lens. And so things, when I tell them back, they come out that way. So um, I feel like I don't have to try that. And when I do, now I'm starting to, um, I guess, impose uh, a desire for the story on it. Um, you know, so I don't want to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, we when I when I handed this over to you, we talked about a number of things: um, symbolism of the moon, uh, masculine and feminine symbolism. And when we talk about masculine and feminine feminine symbolism, we're not talking about modern stereotypes about differences between men and women. We're talking about the way those things reveal themselves over time in mythology um, and in stories. So. Uh, I think that was uh, that was fun to do. I really loved your insight. You pointed out so many things to me um, that never would have occurred to me uh, in the story. So I think that people who the people who watch this uh, watch this who follow your channel are going to get an added layer that's just going to be implicit to the general public. I I generally don't like explaining things to people. Yeah. I, in the past, like, cause I mean, once it's there, I kind of understand why I wrote it, you know, yeah. with dead horse, it dealt with the pandemic. It dealt with this sort of, uh, totalizing system that was coming that they were going to kind of give an exchange for pleasure for, um, an exchange for pleasure for this like control and manipulate yeah. over you. So, um, and so, you know, by the time that thing was coming out, it, we, were, we were about to hit the pandemic in 2020. So That's it's so amazing that I still can't get over that. Like that, yeah. that the, the, the whole album was like a prophecy that just played itself out in front of us. It's pretty amazing. Well, I mean, I, I don't think of my, that as, as that unique though. I saw a lot of things like that. Like I kept, things kept coming to my attention that had just happened in different shows that mm. were, but it was sort of people with a certain type of intuition were already on to where things were heading. Yeah. And, um, it's just like, you know, if I picked up a, you know, uh, a rock and threw it towards a window before that rock hit the window, we would all kind of know it's about to hit the window. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because we, you can see the momentum, the velocity and the trajectory. So um, I think one of the best ways to talk about why I don't want to talk about things too much uh, when it comes to the specific story is an image. I think I've shared this with you before, but it's, it is from Peter Pan. And in the beginning of Peter Pan, uh, it's obviously like a meta 
fairy tale in the sense where it does a lot to explain itself to an audience like films generally wouldn't or a fairy tale generally wouldn't even if you have never never land yeah you have a lot of these more explicit structures overlaid on a fairy tale type story and one of those happens right in the very beginning because it seems like the author whether they did this um intentionally or just by intuition uh understood what they were getting into with the story where peter pan appears in person without a shadow he's not he's not yet a part of this universe that wendy lives in and now her at this coming of age story she she needs to she needs to try on this childish idea she's about to leave behind she needs to experience like mm-hmm. in its full totality like what she's when she leaves the nursery what she's really leaving behind and uh so it's her job to stitch the shadow onto peter pan's foot and that hurts like he doesn't like it right it's so there's this aspect of where i don't want to put too many stitches in peter pan's foot um so people can kind of just absorb the story for themselves yeah uh, to some degree so i hope that wasn't but i think that the process that you're talking about like in terms of the way you wrote it you know this is actually the way that i'm telling people always because i i have people writing me or ask me all the time you know i'm trying to write a story and try to put symbolism into it and they then they just they just they just hit a wall because they can't do it which is actually the it, they're which is inevitable because you can't think about symbolism and write symbolically at the same time. Those two are two different, completely different ways of being. You have to, like you said, I think the way you talked about it where you have an image and then you poke at the image and you turn around it and you you kind of nurture this intuition is a much better way to do it. And then once, you've, once you have something out there, then you can combat with clippers and just kind of prune it a little bit or readjust things slightly so that they're more they're 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 more coherent in terms of the structure but you don't want to do that at the outset yeah and i and two like i'm trying to like so let's just say that something's supposed to be beautiful i'm not i never try to make it pretty i try to make it break my own heart um and it's just it's a it's a very different reaction so like the idea of trying to make something coherent intentionally is that same thing you end up with you end up with pretty instead of heartbreaking <laughs> and uh so <laughs> i don't know if that's just kind of an adjacent analogy but uh so yeah i, I mean my encouragement for artists who uh you want to do that is you you ha- it begins with having to absorb the world differently and uh, we've been lied to about what i think in a lot of ways um in our schooling and not that these things aren't important but sort of the scientific world um, this modern mindset of the things that really matter are things you can't touch, taste, and feel, or you don't really experience firsthand. I think I, one of the first videos I encountered with you is you talking with um, your brother, Mature, about uh, I don't even know how to say that in French, people. Um, I can't pronounce you can say it. Matthew. That's okay. Okay. So, uh, um, he, uh, you, you guys were talking about water, that when you drink water, like, like you, oh, that might have been coffee, you don't experience H2O you experience cold and wet and like, you know, we all, we, we have the problem with HCO. None of us have that in common. We don't know what that is or what it really looks like or how to experience it. But, and so that if we think of it as H2O, we're at a distance from each other. But if we think about it as something cold and refreshing, now we're, Oh, I know cold and refreshing, you know, cold and refreshing. Now we're more connected. Yeah. So there's been this deep personification of the universe itself that has led people back to a point where they don't really know how to tell an embodied stories because they the story because they think the real important facts are what we see at the bottom of a microscope or at the end of a telescope when none of those things can actually be experienced and i believe have led to sort of a modern insanity mm. about things that are right in front of our face we can't see anymore we're colorblind to because yeah. we prioritize those things and we've intellectualized those things as the most important and so i think that that's something also that's there in the the Queen of the Night because the uh, the first episode has to do with this encounter, like a like an encounter, the an encounter between an encounter with something which is bigger than you, like something that is just overwhelming, let's say, um, and it's not it's not in the it's not in the analytical mode, right? It's like a you know imagine a, yeah like seeing a god or seeing this, and and it has to do with the fascination with the with the feminine, and the whole story has to do with this feminine image, which is related to light, light and darkness, to the moon, to the veiling, to the unveiling. Um, and so maybe 
tell us a little bit about like what it is about let's say feminine imagery which you feel needs to be explored or needs to be touched on or needs to be uh yeah that we need to talk in the, about in the power of it and not just in the modern sense where it's like okay we're going to make more roles for women okay yeah. it's like oh great cool there's so many cool things to talk about what are we going to talk about no we're going to give them swords and superpowers and they're going to punch things and and act like jerks like the men do except they'll be like heroes for acting like jerks uh, i know that that's what i just said there is probably like what is he even talking about to some people or they just you know the hair stood up on the end of their back and they started screaming uh, but the I, end of their backs I, I don't know like a cat you know <laughs> um so uh, <laughs> um but i think that really like uh I think that just this idea of supplanting what was um, in the past male with just embodied by female characters, like that can happen in stories, right? Obviously, uh, but it's not, it's you're missing so many great opportunities. And hopefully we've taken some of those opportunities here in this story to show the, the power of femininity in um you know, a more coherent way within how the universe actually manifests itself. Mm. So um let's do a clip. Um I got a little short clip here uh, I want to insert in the video um, of a scene where he first encounters this feminine spirit at a very low, dark place for this little boy. Let's talk about the moon because that appears in the story. This is one of these examples of things that we we can't see anymore uh, or mm -hmm. isn't obvious to people. Okay, so the moon and the sun. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon, roughly. Okay, um, but guess what else? Like that, you know, uh, the sun is 400 times farther away than the moon, which makes them appear roughly the same size in the sky. They're like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. It's like, well, what are the chances of that? Right. And these things are hard to calculate because yeah. we're posing, uh, <laughs> we've got a, there's a lot of factors involved and it has to do with human perspective, but it's a, it's a really rare occurrence that if the world or universe is populated by all types of people and different people on different planets, that this would ever occur on ours. So, um, when things start to become rare to a certain point, you start to see intentionality in it. So I see intentionality all over the universe. I see like the thing I'm about to describe, we see, I see everywhere. Um, so the moon and the sun appear roughly the same size of the sky. So why was it, why did ancient people like always refer to the moon in almost every situation as like a feminine spirit and the sun as a masculine spirit? It's like, well, um, the moon happens to have a 29 day phase and cycle. And guess what? Like women have, you know, matured women have a like roughly a 29 day cycle. And there's no evolutionary correlation between those two things. Like there's been study after study. The last one I could look up was they had um, checked with 7.5 million women to like report on their cycle. And if it correlated with the moon and it will line up once in a while, meaning that some people will, you know, uh, have their cycle at a full moon or a new moon or whatnot. But um, it's not, they're not, uh, there's no scientific reason why that these two things are the same. Now, for someone like me who sees meaning in the universe, I like, okay, this is the discussion of like cosmic feminine, cosmic masculine. And so to, if you never thought about it before, the fact that we have these two like equal sized things in the sky and one exhibits an explicit feminine pattern, right? <laughs> and one uh, that is, I don't know, that could, could be revelatory to someone, you know, now. Like I, I, I talk to people all the time about these kind of things. And they're like, oh my gosh, I never realized that. And it's like, it's like, this was obvious to everyone, you know, prior to 
our modern way of thinking. So yeah, and you can under if you when you understand also that the that the moon waxes and wanes and that it moves from light to darkness and from darkness to light, then you can also understand so much of the some of the mystery of feminine symbolism in relationship to the to those things that are hidden and revealed. You can imagine even uh you know the idea of seduction as this showing and hiding you know, this revealing, but not too much, you know, you don't want to, you want to keep a mystery uh, in this, in this relationship. And so, you know, this idea of the, of the mystery is, is very much related to feminine symbolism and always has been. Yeah. And you talk about this all the time. I haven't seen all your videos, but I've seen quite a few. And you're talking about this idea of unity and multiplicity. And, and during the day when there, there's a unity above, and then there's multiplicity below because this light allows us to name and identify things so that you, you know, you don't walk around in daylight tripping and stumbling and falling into holes generally because these things are made explicit and the night, the opposite manifestation happens. There's multiplicity above, and then there's this unity, but the unity is within darkness below where the ground becomes one thing. All this multiplicity becomes one thing. And all this thing that was one opaque sky becomes multiplicity at night. Um, it's, there's a real, I guess, you know, it might be the wrong analogy, but a, a yin yang kind of relationship. Yeah, of course. These two things. Um, and so I think that's so cool. And there's there's a beautiful story that we experience every day in that. And it's actually a way to govern between order and chaos that appears in stories if you can look at those two patterns correctly. Um, so you, what you're talking about there, you also talked about explicit and implicit. Um because one of the things that happens, you know, so let's say someone reads the Bible and they hear the word light and they think of light as good and darkness as evil. And it's used that way, but it's also not used that way. Right. So there are um, there are things that are kept secret that are hidden from you that are true. Yeah. There are um, there are, are um, analogies like hiding under the shadow of of God's wing, like the shadow being the thing that's needed. Um, so I talk about this, uh, I'm talking about this in Dead Horse a little bit. There's a song called Kings and Queens, and it's talking about this mothering structure of the city. The cars and the trains were the blood in her veins, and the riders inside her breath and alive. But try as she may, the air drifted away, and the city. to behold her pulsing and waltz as each selfish thing fought to make their own name the tombstones of steel and glass were raised a toast to her beauty in their day in the song. and um I was always confused when I was a kid. I would hear these old movies and they refer to someone who was very beautiful as fair. And I'm like, what does fair mean? And it was like, it, it dawned on me and I wrote it into the bridge of that song. And it's talking about the city and, it, and the, the line was, in blinding light, she stands opaque, her silhouette, a welcome break for tired eyes, a resting place. Mm. And, um, you know, if you're crossing the desert and you're burning in the sun and you see, um, you see the outline of a city, Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh, this is that's that's my salvation. Yeah. Um, from the sun, from the sun, from yeah, the from sun. The sun. It's a good thing, right. It's like you're like, oh, the sun's a good thing. It's like it's not always a great thing. I mean, you can you can in life, you can die by water. You can uh, that you need to live. You can die by sunlight, which you need for everything to live. Uh, so. The world's a complicated place and, uh, you know, things aren't as polemic as people make them out to be. And really fairy tales are awesome with that. Having these sort of ambiguous structures that depending on how you approach them manifest as good or evil. Mm. And I think that's, th that's a really great thing in storytelling, this kind of mist. And I love those stories. And I think we've got a little of that in queen of the night here. Um, yeah, definitely. We, I mean, I think that, in the in the story, I mean, I, we don't want to reveal the, the the plot or anything, but there really okay. is this kind of encounter, this seductive encounter, or this fascination, which you know the you can say something like the masculine tries to control or tries to possess, yeah. you know, and then ultimately it's like 
<laughs> no, sorry, man. It's not as easy as you think, you know? Yeah, right. And well, and two, so like, I mean, there's a lot of things that we we might push back against in life. Like someone, like people accuse me of mansplaining. And I'm like, you actually have a point. Like when you're saying that, like, in a, I don't mean in a like, way that someone really doesn't know how to shut you down so they make some sort of in, impotent claim like okay boomer or you know thanks for mansplaining that to me uh you know and i'm not talking about in that sense but the idea that like there that negative symbolic masculine is this idea to over define over explain yeah. pull too far out you know show something you know uh you know, even like even the world of science, you know, uh, there's a great essay by C.S. Lewis called The Abolition of Man, which everyone who watches this channel should read. Yeah, um, it's amazing. But he talks about that, you know, science today would do something, uh, you know, to a person that they wouldn't have considered 100 years earlier doing to a turnip. Um, there's this over masculinization of everything and wanting to pull apart mm -hmm. and for power. Um, yeah. So, right. I, so I have a question. What so with all these movies, because this is kind of a change for for you in a way, I mean, because you were mostly doing music for the, for the large part of your career, you wrote a book, was it last year? You were a fairy tale that- yeah, that's a little experiment I did. It's called uh, The Three Golden Ropes. And a story, like, I mean, you've known me long enough, Jonathan, know like a story pops in my head every day. And uh, I was like, let me just, let me do the practice of kind of putting this into a visualization. So there's an artist named Chad Nuss, um, who's done some work. He's doing concept art on Queen of the Night. Uh, he's fantastic. He has his own uh, comic called The Silence Comics. And he uh, he illustrated it for me. And Chad's art is amazing. So like he made it worth buying. Um, you can find that at DirtPoreRobbins.com. I think I have a link to that somewhere if you wanted to check it out or look at the art. So, uh, but so what are you, so what are you, what's happening? Like where, where are you okay, going? So, uh, all right, so here's the thing. So I do music. Uh, the fun thing about music is it's it manifests itself in in a type of opposite from the way life comes at us normally. So um, when we go out into the world, um, we see things before we see patterns, right? We patterns take, uh, I guess, a type of spiritual discernment in the sense that they're they're not something that manifests in a moment; it manifests over time, and so we have to see the pattern. Um, so life, we see things first; we see patterns second. Music is pattern first and it implies the things so uh beethoven's sixth symphony he was trying to musically describe this you know a pastoral setting in the countryside or uh you know the movies fantasia really have a great explanation of of this relationship between the visual and music but that gives you an example of sort of like the different the different worlds and so I, uh, I I wanted to bring the story in farther. I thought we had a good story to do it visually. And you mentioned that we we have some constraints on that story and how we're telling it visually um, because it's a silent film. And those constraints are really helpful to me as a new director and someone who wanted to really bring a fantastical image, images to life with rockets and zeppelins and uh, moon space travel and, uh, you know. Yeah, the not a $50 million budget. Let's yeah, yeah. Say. So, um so yeah, like putting those constraints on it allowed us to uh, really not have to compromise anything, and uh, tell be and, and have a window in which we could tell that story where you didn't feel like things were missing. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. like a boast. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. So um, it's going to be interesting for people who follow us in the past because like our last re record was a little bit more modern than the Raven Locks, the record we had done before that. It had some more synth elements and even like robotic voices and uh, still with a blend of classical and uh, I think even classic rock in there. Uh, but this one, we're going farther back in time. We're pulling from the romantic period. We're also, you know, as we go farther along in the story, as things modernize, you'll we'll start to throw in some ragtime and elements like that. But at first it starts out, you're going to have, if you're waiting for it, like a, you know, a slapping, pop a rock number you're not going to get one right away in the story so episode one the music's kind of somber and it deals with uh you know some more symbolic content
it's a risk. I mean, but I don't know. I kind of work outcome independent. I just do what I think is what I really want to do. And then mm. I hope people like it. Um, so, it, so how I, do you want, is this something that the storytelling part, like, is it something because that, you know, we need good storytellers. So is this something that you are interested in continuing to do? Like, are you, are you? Oh, absolutely. I want to do it everywhere. I mean, I want to collaborate with other artists too, because I have more stories than I can put out and I really love, and I would love to find um, some people who can visualize those. Um, you know, I just told you about one right before we started our call. And I feel like that's a great there. story, man. I, I, I would love to see that happen. It'd be wonderful. Um, so I'm watching Eric Weinstein on Joe Rogan's podcast. I went back and watched this and he's, they're talking about how like, well, the world's been stripped of this sort of mythological content and story, spirited content and religious content and stuff. And he's like, now it's time to fill it with what's really interesting. And Joe Rogan's like, well, what's really interesting, Eric Weinstein? What does the world need to be focused on? And he's like, the Octonians. Um, I can't do an Eric Weinstein impression and I think it would be insulting if I tried. So I'm going to just talk about <laughs> So the Octonians, if you're not familiar or if you haven't seen the episode, do you know what they are, Jonathan? No, I have no idea what that is. They're this theoretical number set. Right. And he starts to go off about this theoretical number set. And I was like, Eric Weinstein, have you not met a normal person? Ever? <laughs> do you know? Like, do you ever, have you ever fallen in love or what? Like, yeah, what have are you, you ever, doing? Like, ever have a really good meal? Like, have you ever had a funny thing happen to you that you retold later? It's like, this is not where people are at. So this is part of the insanity, though, of the modern world. It's had this dull, dulling effect on storytelling. Um, you know, well, so many stories, like what's really happening is like, though, the zombie invasion is just, it's really a biological element. And here's the, here's scientifically why there's a zombie invasion. It's like, no, that's not why we're telling zombie stories because, oh. because, you know, it's, we're telling zombie stories because, you know, everybody's a zombie. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's why we're telling zombies. It's like there are people just zombieing around and, you know, not even looking at, up at their kids when they come in the room. Yeah. Everyone's. That's where we that's where we're afraid of zombies, because, you know, the conservatives think that uh, the, there's too many liberals in the world and they're all coming to get them and they're going to make them think their way and they're going to take over their mind. And then the, the liberals think there's too many conservatives in the world and they're yeah. coming for them and they're going to take over their mind and they're going to force them to, you know, into the hands maiden tale. Uh, so uh, that's what's that's why we tell zombie stories. Yeah. Is, we're not telling we're not having a discussion about biology. Um, and so. I. Um, that's for sure. Like what you're saying is is great because one of the things I thought from the right from the beginning is like this whole IDW thing. I was like, this is not, this is going to fail. It's going to fail because they don't understand how the world actually changes. It's like, I'm sorry to tell you guys, artists change the world. Not, not like computer programmers and not scientists, like in terms of changes in the sense of what happens in the world. Like you can make a technology. But the dream of the world comes from the prophets and the artists. And even in the scientific revolution, you can see that that Cyrano de Bergerac's, uh, you know, uh, voyage to the moon precedes any scientific desire to go to the moon. Right. The the, the storytellers were the ones, you know, the, the the all the imagery that happened in the 17th century. A lot of it was storytelling. It wasn't. And so we need to. We, the, the kind of IDW type that wants to kind of help restore something without, without art, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to fizzle. People are alone and like everybody has the same things going on. They're waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning and they are just miserable and they, they look to film and they look to story and it's arguing about politics. I mean, I, 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 I followed Russell Brand years ago because he had someone interesting on to me and I pull up his channel now and all he's doing is, is covering American politics. I'm like this yeah. British comedian. It's, it's like, weird. it's this disease that's taking over everybody. And it's like, I think the future belongs to people who are just going to pay attention to the way the world actually manifests, what actually is interesting, uh, what life is actually like and tell those stories. And that's going to win the day. It's, you're right. You're so right. That's what's going to win. There's no there's no way around it, because at some point, this kind of political type storytelling is going to become so crippling. You no, know, I mean, it might get worse for a while, but, you know, in the end, the good stories win. It's just inevitable because they're better. They just have they just have more of reality in them. And so, right. so I think that what you're doing with Queen of the Night and you know, what you've been doing with uh, Drupal Robbins, you know, is is great. I mean, it's right in line. I mean, I'm happy that we're kind of collaborating on on a lot of these things because 
it's uh, I think it's an exciting time to be honest. I, I even though it's kind of like the worst time in a very dark time at this all at once, it's an exciting time because you know these little lights I think can flicker in the in the madness because they'll appear as what they are. You know, I get a little lost for words sometimes because I like I don't know how to describe what I think is really beautiful in a way that people can hear it anymore. And so I kind of don't most of they the time. They just make beautiful things. I just, that's all I know. That's all I can do is try to make beautiful things. And they're not political and they don't hold, I, like, I mean, what you're talking about, you're, you're saying, hey, like it, it, it's nice to have someone or to have people out there who are actually trying just to tell stories because I'm not, I don't have an explicit like proselytizing purpose in what I'm doing at all. I just, I just take what comes to me and, and put it out there. And I think that's, that's the only way that me as a person can make the, anything better, my life better, my family's life better. Um, because I, we get, we get so focused on trying to change the world. And it's like, that's just like, that's yeah. too much for anyone. That's there's not There's something, it. there's something like really exciting yeah, well, also about this time, which is that there's something also, I, this is how I feel. Like you tell me if you're right, but there's something really exciting about feeling like you're in on a secret. This is how I feel sometimes because like, let's say I think that, that your album dead horse is just amazing. Like it's just a, it's just a, it's just a great album without any qualifier. And, but it's still kind of not, it's not like the most, you're not like the most famous band in the world. You know, it's not like everybody knows about dirt Paul Robbins. Um, but that's, there's something about that, which is exciting because there's this thing burgeoning. There's this light that kind of appearing and a few people are able to perceive it. And you know, like there's no doubt about it. You know that this is moving towards the future. And a lot of the stuff you hear on the radio, the stuff you, you stream on Netflix, you can feel like this is just dying. Like it's just this decrepit thing that is kind of decomposing. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so I have, I can perceive this light, which is growing. Uh, not everybody can see it yet, but it's, but it actually makes it somewhat exciting to feel like, you're in on something. Well, I know. I also have like weak, selfish reasons why I like to stay a little under the radar too. It's because uh, I like anonymity a little bit. I mean, here I am in your channel and I'm wearing this, uh, you know, animal print shirt. Like this like zebra print, print thing. <laughs> but man, like the, it's, it, it's, it's a world of sound bites. I wrote a song about this on Dead Horse called Skywriter. Um, because the world's turned into a place where everything's, everyone's a skywriter. Anything I say, there's going to be something I didn't say that can be held against me. Like mm. there's always this something in the negative space of what I've just said, where someone can make me saying something I'm not. Yeah. And, yeah. and the world's awful with that. And so like, there's a part of me that's kind of like, yeah, I'd be totally happy to just have enough of an income to keep making art. And then people find it when I'm dead. And so they can't, <laughs> you know, so they can't ruin my life. Like that's a little weak and selfish of me sometimes not very courageous, but I have like, the, the modern world has made me like I there's no nothing in me left that would want to do this for celebrity. Like there's just, it's not there. It's like that's that's hard. That's like my biggest fear is to be a celebrity, I guess, in any capacity. So I also revel in the sort of anonymity of what we do that uh, there are people that it seems to impact and really enjoy it. And I'm like happy, like I'm like, yeah, shh, keep it, keep it, keep it there. Just enough income for I can keep making more for you. But, shh, but no, actually, we do need people. I don't want to. We do need people to share the, the, no, the video no. when it comes out. There, there's a stronger part of me that's like, who cares? Okay, so they'll tear you apart. You're just going to have to go let feed yourself to the wolves if you're going to. You're, you're going to want to manifest your full potential. So that's kind of what I end up acting on. I have all these subtle fears. But at the end of the day, we really need people to share this and watch this. And if you love it, like, you know. Uh, let your friends in on it. Like that's, that's where, that's our entire marketing plan. Basically outside of like coming on your channel, coming onto your channel and talking like a uh, Derek uh, Fiedler who did a really great review of your brother's book, uh, the language of creation. And he get a really great response to Matthew McConaughey and Joe Rogan about the burning bush on symbolism of that. Um, he's going to, he's going to be doing uh, breakdowns of the episode for people in the sub symbolic world who want to hear that kind of thing. Cool. So we can link to him, but uh, yeah, I'm not doing much to promote it right now. So, and that's part of the reason we didn't take it straight to uh, streaming services. Cause it's actually not that hard to get on streaming services, but I think Netflix has like 15,000 movies in their catalog. So you can get into this catalog and make no money and pay money on the outside to advertise to get people to go watch it on their platform. And I'm like, yeah. that's not a great starting point. 
So right now we're kind of relying on everybody to be like, to absorb this. Maybe um, we have a Patreon channel, like, I mean, Patreon account, if they want to give us some money there, <laughs> that's also helpful for the post-production because otherwise I'm paying out of pocket. Um, so uh, to get this done, but yeah, we're going to be releasing the episodes over the next few months. Uh, one at a time, the story evolves quickly uh, by episode two. Uh, it moves into uh, what is the present day for the story because the, the prologue takes place ahead of that. And uh, things start to move really fast and the music gets faster. Cool. And, uh, so uh, we're going to be releasing an episode maybe every six weeks. Um, and so we do need a little help financially getting that out there and done. Uh, I, we're going to do it. It's just a matter of who's going to be, who, who's going to help. <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to get done. And then when it's done, we're going to release the the full film as one entire cohesive unit. Uh, on- but it's also an album. If I It's understand. an album. Yeah. Okay. I keep forgetting to talk about the music because the music's old. Because the music is all original music that you're writing yeah. for the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I did with this video, I'll take over the intro like I do last time I'm on the channel with something I've done. So that's that score from the film. And uh, yeah, we've got new music. So there's going to be a single, at least one single released uh, song or two released with every episode. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's how it's going to do. That's great. Yeah, it'll be a full record when the movie comes out. It'll be, you know, 60 minutes of music that's done. So um, not like more instrumental content than normal. And I'm not sure how much of that I'll put on the final record, depending on how strong it is or um, on its own without the visual. So one of the hard things about scoring for people out there that do music and want to score, because scoring is like a real, like, Ooh, like a real luring business for people um, is that it's weird. Once you put music's not the same as when you're making music, just to listen to as music and music to accompany a film Mm. Uh, because the film does a lot of the work. Like if there are a lot of shows where I was like, oh, this is great. And then I pull the stuff down. Like the Mandalorian is one of them. Like uh, I love the original Star Wars scores and the, and the Mandalorian's cool. But then when I pull it out by itself and listen to it next to a John Williams piece, I'm like, well, gee, not fair to the composer to compare to John Williams. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's like, um, it's like, oh, like this is not, he, actually there's not a ton happening. It's just kind of textured and, and slightly. Yeah small amounts of melodic content. Um, so yeah, that's an important thing for people who want to get into scoring, or even if you're like someone who never pays attention to the score, start paying attention to it and figure out what you like and what you don't like. Uh, it's, it's an interesting world. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's some of the stuff has to, it can't be your most va-va-voom, like best thing to listen to by itself. <laughs> if it's going to accompany the image and serve the image. And yeah, the story. Image. So. But you have, you have some songs with, uh, with words and everything. It's not just music. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we'll have we'll have a lyric video that comes out a few days. So this video hopefully airs on the day of the episode, and the episode yeah, one yeah. comes out November sixteenth at nine p.m. and uh, it's the prologue to the bigger story. So uh, that's on our YouTube channel, which we're Dirt Poor Robins. You can find us pretty easily, and you know, like and subscribe, smash that like button. Um, <laughs> So I'm just going to just spend the rest of the talk here advertising my channel. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's great. Talk. I think people have to, I think people have to, uh, to check it out and uh, you know, you know, leave comments of course. And uh, yeah, I think just understanding that this is really, this is something that we're hoping to see flower, you know, both Neil and I, we've been talking in private for years by now you got to meet in person this year <laughs> yeah that's right we actually did in florida it does exist great. everyone people are starting to wonder if you exist yeah we actually have legs you know like yeah. a few <laughs> <laughs> but we're really hoping that that you know these little gestures we're posing is just also going to be impetus for other people people that are watching this people that are that are getting excited also about these this returning to kind of good stories and so uh so we're excited to see where it goes and we hope that every, that other artists other storytellers uh get involved and you know and i you know and if you're also if you're a professional artist and you a lot of people i've been in contact with recently if you're a professional artist if you're a musician if you are a a, a painter or a, a illustrator or a, a filmmaker you know reach out because we're we're kind of, uh, yeah, we're building up to some interesting stuff and we're excited to have at least people have a buzz around around what's going on and and uh, and who knows where this is going to lead? Who knows? Yeah, I think eventually there's going to be, it's, it just seems like it's heading that way. There's going to be a collective of people that are doing quality and people that want to learn to do quality and uh, work and 
and lead up to that. Also, like here, I'll hijack Jonathan's channel for a second. I really think he needs to do an online symbolic world conference um, with, you know, some of the characters from his Avengers universe in there. Um, the other people he has on his channel. Uh, if you think that's a good idea, like someone comment that in like it and let him know that a symbolic world conference online would be a terrific idea and you would be glad to attend. <laughs> all right. Okay, Neil. So, let, so, all right. So we're all helping each other. All right, everybody. So, so thanks for your attention, you know, check out the queen of the night and everything else dirt poor Robbins is doing. Like I said, uh, their last album dead horse is really like just one of my favorite albums. I listen to it all the time. Uh, and my kids love it too. My daughter, they all have, uh, they all have the merch and they, they love to, 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 uh, make help their friends discover, uh, their band. So, so check it out and uh, and uh, stay tuned for more discussion with Neil in the future. And also, um, you know, like we said, who knows where this is going to lead? We might be surprised uh, to find out where all of this is going. So thanks, everybody, for your time. Talk to you very soon again. Bye-bye.